Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this first of the uh, best abstracts uh, series uh, from the ESG. My name is Lars Abakin, and I have the honor to chair this session together with uh, Claudio De Angelis from uh, Turin, Italy. Myself, I'm from Oslo, Norway, and we've both been affiliated with the ESG, obviously. This is one way of trying to extract all the um, treasures which uh, unfortunately were not able to be presented uh, during the meeting in uh, Dublin. And so we hope that this will be a reasonable uh, replacement and will uh, instigate the same amount of discussion uh, as the live presentations would have. Um, some housekeeping on the next slide. Um, as you know, the, um, the, uh, the ESG have for years uh, been establishing a series of, uh, of uh, webinars um, with the, uh, you know, the options of interaction that that entails. But this is the first time we're extracting uh, material from uh, a real meeting that didn't happen. So uh, we do hope that you will be able to interact uh, today in the similar fashion as you would be in the halls of Dublin. And uh, different from the ESG, ESG days, this is, of course, free. Um, the um, uh, abstracts that you will have presented are the top rated abstracts uh, within the area of EUS and ERCP, um, as you can see here. And um, each uh, talk is uh, for 10 minutes max and sharp. And we will stop the presentation at 10 minutes uh, to allow for discussion as well. And so we will not have uh, questions during the talks, but uh, we would very much welcome you to uh, pose your questions uh, through the chat function of Zoom, which uh, you presumably know. Uh, that way it's easier for, uh, for myself and uh, my co-chair to, to pick the uh, most relevant ones and post them to the whole audience. So with that, um, I give my word, give the word to my colleague Claudio to present the first speaker. Okay. Hello, it is a pleasure for me to be here with uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Lars Abaken to present and moderate the today ESG webinar. And uh, I should tell you that uh, we must be grateful to the ESG board uh, because we are able to offer to the presenter the opportunity to present the work and the results of their work to, we hope, a vast audience because this opportunity, as already Lars said, uh, was lost due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And now let's start uh, with uh, the first presenter, the first panelist, uh, this is uh, Stefano Crino from uh, Verona, Italia. And uh, the title of his uh, presentation uh, is uh, EUS FNB with uh, versus uh, without Rose, an interim analysis of an international randomized non-inferiority study. So the stage uh, is uh, yours, Stefano, please, you can start. Thank you, Professor, and thanks for the possibility to present the preliminary results of our study today. And also thanks to the scientific committee for the really appreciated award. Next, please. U.S. Fanidal aspiration with a rapid on-site evaluation rose is currently considered to be the most accurate technique for the diagnosis of solid pancreatic lesions. Besides undoubtful advantages, ROSE have several limitations, mainly related to the lack of availability of expert pathologists and to the cost of the procedure. Moreover, uh, cytological specimens are often suboptimal for additional immunohistochemical staining that, is re that are required to define the diagnosis of several rare conditions. Next. So to overcome limitation of rows and cytology, different biopsy needles have been designed 
to uh, acquire histological specimens. And there are, there are now solid evidences that USFNB outperform USFNA both in randomized trials and meta-analysis. So current practice is now moving from phenidyl aspiration to phenidyl biopsy. Next. However, valuable cytological specimens for rows can be obtained even using FNB needles with the touch and print cytology. So FNB with rows is currently used in many centers where rose is available, trying to combine the advantages of, ro of rose and cytology and histology. Next, please. However, the diagnostic accuracy of USFNB alone for solid pancreatic lesions has been reported ranging between 90 to 95%. And there is no evidence that rose improves the outcomes of USFNB alone. So our hypothesis was that US FNB alone was not inferior to US FNB with the rows. Next, please. So we designed a randomized non inferiority study involving 15 centers, not only in Europe, but also in USA, Japan, and Australia. And we randomized patients with solid pancreatic lesions to undergo US FNB alone or US FNB with rows. Three different needles were used, all from uh, new generation needles, the Sharkore 22 gauge, the Acquire 22 gauge, or the Procore 20 gauge. And three needle passes were performed in the FNB without a rose arm. Whereas in the FNB with the rose arm, after adequacy was reached at rose, additional passes up to a maximum of three were performed for further histological evaluation. The sample size was um, calculated to uh, assess the non-inferiority of uh, USFNB alone, considering a clinically acceptable threshold of inferiority of 5% and amounts to 730 patients. So we decided to randomize 800 patients per 100 per group to counteract dropout and lost follow-up. Next, please. The primary aim was diagnostic accuracy compared to the gold standard diagnosis that was defined on surgical specimen whenever available. And in non resected patients was based on diagnostic workup and confirmed by a congruent clinical disease uh, course of at least six months. Next, please. Secondary aims were safety. So the rate of adverse events uh, defined according to the international lexicon. The core procurement yield, so the rate of samples with tissue core of at least 550 micron. The quality of acquired uh, samples defined as tissue integrity and blood contamination. And the time of the sampling procedure. So the time between the insertion of the needle for the first pass to the removal of the needle after the third pass. Moreover, in the US FNB alone arm, we evaluated the performance of microscopic on-site evaluation. So the concordance rate between a white tissue observed by the endoscopist and a core at histological evaluation. Next, please. We have completed the randomization, the enrollment of 800 patients and today I'm going to present data and results about 548 patients that are a little, a little bit more than those reported in the abstract because meanwhile we have completed the follow-up of a number of patients. And in particular, today we will talk about 275 patients in the FNB with rose arm and 273 patients in the FNB alone arm. Next, please. I'm sorry for this table that probably is not so easy to be read, but it's just to demonstrate that uh, there is no difference between the two groups in terms of demographics, needle type used, <clears throat> lesion site and lesion size, the biopsy route, and the distance between the transducer and the lesion, the sampling technique used, and the final diagnosis. 
Next, please. And if you look at the primary outcome results, you can see an impressive 95% of accuracy in the FMB with the rose arm using standard criteria that correspond to 90% of accuracy using more restrictive criteria. But, next please. If you look at the FNB alone arm, you can see that there is no difference between the two groups, both using standard criteria and restrictive criteria. Next, please. Moreover, we stratified the primary outcome according to the needle type used. And we found that in the FNB with rose arm, all the three needles used performed very well, exceeding 90% of accuracy. But again, please next. If you compare with the F and B alone arm, you can see that there is no difference between the two groups. Next, please. About secondary outcomes, we found no difference between the two arms in terms of adverse events, core procurement yield, sample quality, both considering the tissue quantity and the blood contamination, but the procedure was significantly longer in the F and B with rose arm. Next, please. Moreover, we compared the performance of the three needles in terms of histologic yield, but we found no differences uh, among the three needles. And most in the FMB alone arm performed very well with a 95% of concordance between a white core at gross visualization and a core at histopathological evalu uh, evaluation. Next, please. So in conclusion, uh, our study, our preliminary results show that USFNB with rose has very high diagnostic accuracy, regardless of the needle type used. However, uh, we uh, demonstrated that USFNB without rose performed equally, but with a shorter time of the sampling procedure and speaks in favor of the possibility to definitely abandon rose. However, we will test the non-inferiority of USFMB alone at the end of the study with the proper sample size. Next, please. I would like to thank all my co-authors and in particular Alberto Larghi because we designed and developed the study together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano, and congratulations for uh, this uh, paper for this abstract. Uh, this is only an interim analysis, but quite uh, interesting. As we know, the use of ROSE has been under debate for many, many years. There's a lot uh, of literature about this, but uh, the current evidence is not concordant and the advantages of a ROSE or not ROSE remain uh, conflicting. So in the ESG guideline of April 2017, uh, in the ESG technical guideline on EUSFNA, ESG equally <laughs> recommends US guided sampling with or without uh, uh, rows. This is uh, uh, a special uh, uh, field in which we are speaking about the new needles for uh, FNB. And uh, also in this case, uh, uh, the debate is uh, if it is possible that uh, rows can uh, uh, increase uh, the accuracy of uh, EUSFNB. This preliminary interim analysis of your international uh, randomized study uh, seems to demonstrate that uh, USFNB without rows uh, performs equally than uh, with rows and uh, with a shorter time of the sampling procedure. And uh, to me also seems to be very interesting uh, that uh, EOSFNB with ROSE showed very high diagnostic accuracy, regardless the histology needle type uh, uh, used. So we can uh, have a look with Lars uh, about uh, the question on the chat. Lars, have you seen some yeah so uh, yeah so again thanks for a very interesting uh, study i think it's uh, commendable to be able to present this kind of uh, multi center experience from uh, several uh, high level uh, units across europe so um these were all fnb needles and 
And um, one of the questions relates to the utility of FNB versus FNA. I think uh, ESB at their latest guidelines did not prefer one over the other. And so um, one question to the presenter would be how do you think these data relate to the utility of FNA with and without the roles? It, would that be a similar situation or would that be something different? Uh, I can say that um, is it true that we did, uh, didn't compare FNA with FNB because we really think that uh, in the future all centers will move to phenyl biopsy for several reasons. Um, e uh, also because these new needles has um, have a very good uh, um, histological yield. And uh, I think that there is a, a new, uh, really a recent uh, paper that demonstrated that uh, US FNB with ROSE is uh, uh, outperform US FNA with ROSE. And also there is a randomized trial ongoing in uh, Hong Kong, uh, comparing FNA with ROSE with FNB without ROSE. So I think that in the future, we'll, we will be able to uh, suggest or not uh, ROSE at all. One more comment about uh, you know preparing slides like this for with an FNB needle as opposed to doing a uh, cell block informally indirectly, which does not seem to have been uh, used at all in this study. Can you comment on that as opposed to making slides? This one. Yes, um, you're right, and I agree with your question. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, I can say that touching print cytology is not so easy and immediate to to be performed. So we, before starting the study, asked at centers to um, make several cases with the touch and print cytology to become confident with it. In particular, while you smearing the tissue, you must be very uh, soft uh, to, uh, to avoid a, a crush artifact of the tissue and uh, clots. But after um, two, three cases, uh, pathologists were really happy of that. And there is also a study from our centers that demonstrated the quality of, touch, of, of SMERS from standard uh, FNA cytology and touch and print cytology is the same. So I think that, um, of course, pathologists or nurses or technicians must uh, practice with uh, uh, F and B samples, but uh, the touch and print cytology performed very well. There are also some uh, questions about uh, adverse events, and uh, someone asked that if uh, there uh, is a difference in uh, adverse events rates between the three needles used, or uh, if you can comment about uh, adverse events for uh, the needles for F and B. No, we we had uh, we have we observed only nine adverse events uh, without differences, uh, not only between the two groups but also between the needles. Uh, so I think that there is no relation between uh, the type of the procedure, the technique, and uh, adverse events. Adverse events are very very rare. There are also comments. Um about you know, the standardization of technique and whether other elements in the procedure matters in terms of the quality of the sample. I think uh, one strength of this study was that this was not a part of the comparison. So probably what you are comparing is a sort of a overall range of the different uh, techniques in terms of uh, suction, in terms of fanning, in terms of you know, those factors which may also play a role, but they probably evens out in such a study. Yes, um, the most common technique used was a slow pull, uh, followed by suction, and in a few cases by the wet technique. However, uh, there are a, a recent meta-analysis that show uh, really not so high differences between slow pull and suction. However, at the end of the study, we probably will perform a post-hoc analysis, uh, something some like a multivariate analysis to understand if there is uh, or not uh, other factors uh, impacting on diagnostic accuracy. However, I believe that uh, because of a very high diagnostic accuracy in both arms, uh, we will not find a, a difference. 
Um, okay, I think in the Claudio, did you have one more? Comment? Yes, one, one more, one more question. Uh, when you speak about uh, secondary aims and core procurement, do you found no significant differences between the three types of biopsy needle. But uh, I think that a relevant point could be not only the number of cores uh, you get, but also the size, the length of the core. Can you give us uh, any comment about this for the three types of needle or not? Yeah, uh, if, I think that in this case, for this question is really, really important, the sample size. Uh, we read a lot of paper uh, underpowered. And uh, for example, if you look at the abstract of the same study, uh, we have submitted, you can see that there was a difference, a significant difference in favor of end cutting needles against the site fenestrated one. But now we found no differences. So uh, we need a really good sample size to draw conclusions. And uh, also we, uh, about, not only uh, about the second point, so the, not only the number of course, but also the length we considered 550 micron as a core. Uh, differently, uh, smaller pieces of tissue were defined as, mi as microfragments. And in the tissue quality score that uh, serves as a, um, um, a scale for um, evaluating the, the sample quality, we evaluated the microfragments and the number of cores defined as a piece of tissue of 550 micron. So we measured all the uh, samples. So I think that um, our results will be uh, accurate. Okay, and uh, the, the last one, really, your preliminary results seem to demonstrate that MOSE is quite accurate. You talk about 95% concordance in defining the specimen that later the pathologist judged as useful histological cores. Yeah. So do you think that MOSE can be a useful adjunct, an added value to AUSFMB without ROSE? Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, there is a paper submitted in endoscopy that uh, will try to demonstrate that, uh, Ro that MOSE is not useful. Uh, and moreover, we have to think about uh, the future of US FNB. So the uh, molecular diagnostic that probably our pathology, pathologists uh, will do on our samples. So most can be useful to reduce the number of passes. However, in the future, we will probably perform more passes to uh, collect additional tissue for um, ancillary tests and uh, molecular diagnostics. So uh, you can use most to be sure that you have collected uh, a good sample, of, uh, right? But I think it will, we will be not useful uh, to, to regulate the number of passes. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations uh, again for this uh, abstract. And uh, now we leave the floor to Lars. To, in you. order to introduce the second presenter of today. Lars, please. Yeah, so we're uh, switching gears now to the uh, reign of ERCP. And it's a pleasure to uh, present uh, Dr. Xanish Das, who will uh, talk about aggressive hydration versus high dose rectal indomethacine in the prevention of post endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatic pancreatitis. And I think uh, any you know high quality uh, evaluation of ways to mitigate uh, post-GRCP pancreatitis are well worth listening to. So please, Dr. Das. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good evening. I would like to thank the ESG for providing me the opportunity to present our data of this randomized controlled trial comparing the effectiveness of ag aggressive hydration versus high-dose rectal indomethacin in the prevention of post-ERCP pancreatitis. Uh, next slide, please. Pancreatitis is an important complication of ERCP. And over the last 50 years, a lot of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic uh, interventions have been developed to prevent e post-TRCP pancreatitis. Among the pharmacologic methods, rectal non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug 
is recommended as a standard pharmacologic prophylaxis in by various endoscopic societies in different parts of the world. However, recently, vigorous uh, periprocedural hydration with lactate to ring solution is emerging as an effective modality for the treatment uh, for the prophylaxis of post ERCP pancreatitis. There has been no head to head comparison between these two in the published literature. Next, please. So, the methods. Next. <clears throat> This is a prospective randomized open little non inferiority parallel assigned equal allocation controlled clinical trial in a tertiary care hospital performing a high volume ERCP. All adults who were referred for ERCP were, were included if they did not uh, satisfy the exclusion criteria. Next, please. The, we excluded patients who are not having a virgin or intact papilla, as well as those having ongoing acute pancreatitis or chronic calcific pancreatitis or pancreatic head mass and those who are having standard contraindication to ERCP. In addition, patients with significant comorbid illnesses that made them more susceptible to develop uh, uh, complications or adverse effects of vigorous hydration on administration of non steroidal uh, anti inflammatory drugs were also excluded. In addition, we also excluded malignancies. Next slide, please. Next, please. The eligible sub subjects they underwent simple randomization by lottery and blinded allocation. Those receiving vigorous uh, hydration, those allocated to the vigorous hydration group received intravenous lactate to ring solution at the rate of three milliliter per kg per hour during the procedure with a 20 cc per kilogram bolus immediately after the completion of the procedure. And then uh, again at the rate of three milliliter per kg per hour for another eight hours. Whereas those allocated to the rectal endometrism group we receive per rectal suppository of 100 milligram of endometazine immediately after completion of the procedure. ERCP was done in prone position with conscious sedation, so using propofol, where guided cannulation was attempted with a pull type introtom for at least 10 minutes, and then a pre cut axis was attempted as a salvage method. Pancreatic duct stent insertion was uh, at the discretion of the individual endoscopist. Next slide, please. Next, please. Uh, uh, post ERCP assessment, those receiving vigorous hydrations were monitored clinically for, uh, for their volume status. All uh, patients were observed for at least eight hours in the recovery room and were assessed at two and eight hours for epigastric pain and serum amylase estimation. Severity of pain was assessed by the Likert scale. Those with persistent post ERCP pain after eight hours were admitted. And they were hydrated with intravenous uh, lactate to bring the solution at the rate of 3 ml per kg per hour. And those who were in the endometrium arm also received an additional bolus of 20 mg per kg. All patients were contacted at 24 hours for development of post ERCP pancreatitis, which was managed according to standard guidelines. And everybody was contacted telephonically after seven days after ERCP to uh, capture delayed adverse events. Next slide, please. The primary outcome was the incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis as defined by Cotton's criteria. Among the secondary outcomes, we looked into the incidence of post ERCP pain, elevated serum amylase, post ERCP pain lasting less than eight hours, severity of the post ERCP pancreatitis, clinical volume overload, other post ERCP complications, and death. All analysis was done by intention to treat. Next slide, please. Next slide. Assuming a pancreatitis incidence of 9% in the endometrium in arm and a non inferiority margin of 4%, a minimum sample size of 171 patients in the two arm was calculated. Uh, the null hypothesis stated that the vigorous hydration is inferior to erectile endometrium. The trial was registered and the ethical clearance was obtained. Next slide, please. The demographic and ERCP procedural data was collected. Endoscopic experience was classified arbitrarily as early and advanced. The presence of risk factors for post ERCP pancreatitis were also documented. Next slide, please. Uh, statistical analysis was done. Mean, median, standard deviation, range, and proportions were, cal uh, calcul were calculated as appropriate. 
Uh, Pearson chi-squared was used for categorical variables and student t-test and manual t-u was used for continuous variables. For the primary outcome, odds ratio and absolute risk reduction were also calculated. A p-value of 0 0.05 was considered significant. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the results. Uh, 521 patients were assessed over a period of five months from October 2017 to February 2018. 352 of them were eligible and randomized. 178 were allocated to the hydration arm and 174 for the endometriosis arm. Thus, the intention to treat the population was 178 and 174, respectively. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide gives the baseline characteristic of the two arms, which was uh, which we just want to show that the two arms were e evenly matched with regard to age, sex, BMI, the grading of procedural severity, and the risk factors for post ERCP pancreatitis, as well as endoscopist experience and placement of pancreatic duct stents. Polydocolithiasis was uh, uh, significantly more common in the hydration arm than in the endometazin arm, whereas indeterminate biliary stri uh, stricture was uh, partially more common in the in endometazin arm. Next slide, please. Uh, the two arms were the, uh, the results of the two arms were not statistically dif uh, different with regard to the rate of cannulation success, inadvertent PD entry, or precut access, or therapeutic success. Two thirds of the patients had more than three or more risk factors for post ERCP pancreatitis. However, none of the patients had a prior history of post ERCP pancreatitis or recurrent acute pancreatitis or underwent ERCP for uh, sphincter of or die dysfunction. No patients were lost to follow up by, say, at the end of seven. Next slide, please. Uh, the primary outcome, the post-ERCP pancreatitis incidence was 0.6% in the hydration arm and 2.9% in the endometriosis arm, with an absolute risk reduction of 2.3% and an odds ratio of 0.19. This was not statistically significant. Next slide, please. Thus, the null hypothesis was rejected. Next, please. There was no significant difference with regard to the secondary outcomes between the two groups with respect to the post-ERCP pain or uh, uh, post-ERCP pancreatitis severity or other post-ERCP complication as well as death. None of the patients in the hydration arm developed any clinical signs of volume overload. Next slide, please. Thus, in conclusion, vigorous periprocedural hydration with lactated ringers solution is not inferior to post-procedure high-dose rectal endometacid with respect to prevention of post-ERCP pancreatitis. Next slide, please. The main limitations of our study was that it was a single center study where overall the incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis was low. Thus, whether uh, vigorous hydration is actually better than rectal endometriosis was could not be adequately answered in our study. Uh, we have a uh, strength was that it was a prospective randomized trial with sample size calculation, standard accepted outcome measured, and a non-inferior design. Next slide, please. We, uh, none of us had any uh, potential conflicts of interest to declare. And I would like to thank, take this opportunity to thank all my colleagues and the endoscopy staff for allowing us to perform this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das. That's uh, excellent data. Um, I think your biggest problem is your success. Uh, because with these numbers, uh, these low numbers of post-ERCP pancreatitis, it's almost impossible to show any kind of differences, isn't it? Yeah. Can you explain, can you explain why they were so low? Yeah. Uh, one, I mean, all of our patients were receiving one form of prophylaxis or the, either it was rectal endometriosis or vigorous hydration. Moreover, none of our patients had a past history of post-ERCP pancreatitis or a history of recurrent acute pancreatitis or the indication of ERCP was not for sphincter or podi dysfunction. Now, these are actually very high-risk procedures for uh, post-ERCP pancreatitis. 
although the ADA study majority, I mean, it was a relatively young cohort with uh, almost 70% were uh, females. Uh, the major indication of uh, uh, ERCP was actually polydopolithiasis, I mean, which probably might be the reason why overall there was a, a low rate of uh, post-ERCP pancreatitis in a study. Okay, there is uh, one question about cannulation time or probably sort of the um, fumble factor. Did you measure that or did you have any sort of uh, indicator of when uh, the um, uh, cannulation was a struggle? Yeah, I mean, we, we had a definition of at least we tried for 10 minutes was a, a, a standard cannulation time. And if it was not successful, then we could uh, use a salvage procedure like pre-cut or uh, uh, usually a needle knife, uh, spring trot or fistula or, or Okay. Okay. I think these two ways of protecting against pancreatitis are very different. And ideally, we would like to be able to stratify patients to one or the other, depending on some other factor. Do you have any idea whether some patients lend themselves more to hydration versus indomethacin, or should everybody have both? Or, I mean, why wouldn't you combine them? Uh, I would uh, think that I'm in a, a hydration. I mean, this rate is probably riskier in a lot of patients with uh, comorbidities who are undergoing ERCP, especially who are too elderly or having an underlying uh, cardiac or renal or uh, liver disease. Or, uh, and uh, probably in, uh, uh, we can, I mean, according to whether the uh, the risk of adverse events of the uh, prophylaxis, we can divide uh, that uh, those who have a lower risk for that can go for hydration, those who have a uh, lower risk for the other can go for rectal endometrosis. There are other two questions from the audience. Uh, Constantinos Triantafilou asks, uh, would you perform a subanalysis in subjects with more than three risk factors for uh, post ERCP yeah. pancreatitis? Yeah, although, uh, yeah, we have done that. And uh, although I didn't present it, uh, in them, uh, we found that uh, uh, hydration was statistically uh, more uh, significantly reduced the incidence of uh, uh, post ERCP pancreatitis compared to rectal endometriosis. That was only in the subgroup who had more than three, three or more risk factors. And uh, might be useful to have a third arm with patients who have both fluids and endometacin. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, but it will need, uh, I think, probably uh, a larger number of larger number of patients. Patients. Okay. I, I noticed that uh, very few of your patients uh, received a uh, prophylactic pancreatic stent. Uh, yeah. Usually, if you, I would say. So, uh, can you comment on that? Do you think the role of pancreatic stent is uh, diminishing and being replaced by these other modalities? Or maybe it's, uh, I mean, the uh, use of pancreatic stents is not that uh, frequent or not that uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our country or in, our, uh, in the cohort in which we did, the, did this trial. Uh, rather than whether it is diminishing or not, I wouldn't comment on that. Yeah. And uh, finally, somebody is suggesting uh, lipase uh, is a more accurate parameter than amylase uh, in terms of detecting pancreatitis. Do you think that is a valid point? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That is also a valid point, but. Uh, I would also say that in most of the trials of post ERCP pancreatitis, amylase has usually been used as a marker, and the, the definition is still by amylase, not by the lipase levels. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. I think this is very interesting data, and um, thank you so much for presenting them. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'll leave the word to Claudio again. Okay, thank you, Lars. Back to the EUS issue. 
with the, the third and last presenter of uh, today ESG webinar. We are speaking about uh, Dr. Mohamed Ghazmi from the Hôpital Nord de Marseille, co-worker of our good friend, Professor Marc Barthé. The topic is a very hot one in these days, RFA of pancreatic uh, lesion, specifically neuroendocrine tumors and pancreatic cystic tumors. So, Dr. Gasmi, please, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm pleased and proud to present results of a study with follow-up more now than three years. Next slide, please. This is multicentric prospective French study, which include net lower than two centimeters, branch duct IPA men with worrisome features, MCA. 30 patients were included Initial follow-up was one year and then extended over three years. Next one, please. How to do the AFA with general anesthesia, antibiotics prophylaxis, and NS aid. In case of cystic tumor, we have to suck partially the cystic fluid content. Here is the generator with a seat seating of 50 watts current and then the RFA needle is a 19 gauge. And on the left, you have the freezing pump. Next one, please. Next. This is a film. Okay. This is a typical net located in the body of pancreas with hypervascularization in signal Doppler and after injection of Sonovu. We apply the LFA needle 19 gauge easily in the lesion and apply the current until white bubbles appearance. And then we apply a second shot in another part of the lesion and apply the current until white bubbles appearance. The control show no vascularization after some of you. So the treatment is complete. Next one. The second case, next. The second case is an IPA man with mural nodule. The first step consists to suck partially the fluid in the lesion, and then we apply the RFA needle until white bubbles appearance in the lesion. We apply a sudden shot in another part of the lesion until white bubbles appearance. And then the control showed no complication in pancreas and in the vessel near the pancreas. Next slide, please. What are objectives of our study? The primary objective is anti-tumor efficacy at least three years follow-up. Results were classified as complete resolution when disappearance or necrosis are noted. Significant response when decrease more than 50% or complete resolution are noted. And failure when decrease lower than 50% or no effect are noted. Next slide. This prospective multicenter study include 16 men and 14 women. One patient was excluded for pancreatic metastasis of renal cancer. At inclusion, there were 12 patients with 14 nets with a 13.4 millimeter size and 17 patients with PCN. 16 of them had IPMN and one patient with MCA with a 29.1 millimeter mean size. 12 of, 12 of them had mirror nodules and four increased thickness of the cyst wall. Next slide. 
quartal, uh, the efficacy in net. All the patients were followed at least three years with mean 45.6 months. Despite one patient died at 42 months follow-up from suicide, he had complete disappearance of the two nets treated. So the results, at one year, we have 12 disappearance, and at three years, one late recurrence. At one year, we have two failures, and at three years, we have one late success and one metastatic evolution. The final results, we have 85% uh, success. So look now for the patient, look now to the patient with metastatic evolution. He developed liver metastasis 13 months after a second LFA initiation. The second lecture of the pathological examination of the first FNA was corrected from G1 to G2 of the whole classification. Next slide. Now results in PCN. All patients were followed at least three years with mean 42.6 months. Three patients died from hepatocellular carcinoma, stroke, and distant pancreatic cancer with metastasis. Two of these three died patients had distant pancreatic cancer. They, 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 they were for IPMA located in the head and developed pancreatic adenocarcinoma in the tail without previous cystic lesion. So probably related to panin. We can see that, uh, we have stable significant response with 69.8% at one year and 66.6% at three years. We have no late recurrence and no mural nodule. Next slide. The long-term outcome now, three patients had immediate complications following a RSLFA, one pancreatitis, which was conservati conservatively managed, one duodenal perforation, which was surgically managed, and one pancreatic duct stenosis, which was endoscopically managed. All uh, the patients recovery without cicala and the complete disappearance of the initial lesions. No delayed adverse events related to the initial station during the follow-up. Please, next one, please. In conclusion, early serifa management of pancreatic net or PCN is associated with an efficient long-term outcome. Take care to distant pancreatic adenocarcinoma in case of APMN or one late benign recurrence of NATE, which requiring an accurate and sustained OS follow-up. Uh, we have no late complication. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. This is uh, the, a follow-up uh, longer than uh, three years of the study that you published uh, two, one, two years ago. So we are here in the delicate field of uh, management of asymptomatic uh, patients. Uh, talking about lesion in the pancreas that has been always surgically treated or not treated at all and only observed and followed up uh, in well-defined uh, cases. So uh, the most important question, I think, is uh, who should we treat with RFA, both in the field of neuroendocrine tumors and in the field of uh, pancreatic uh, cystic uh, tumors, neoplasias? Can you comment about uh, the uh, indication for treatment in your study? In our team, we treat uh, net pancreatic uh, tumor uh, when this tumor is lower than two centimeter. Wh why we treat them? Because uh, the evolution is uh, unknown. Um, some, some patients have uh, local, uh, okay, uh, local evolution of their uh, lesion, and some of them can uh, develop uh, node, meta node metastasis or liver metastasis 
if there is no treatment of, a law of uh, their uh, lesion. The, uh, the guidelines of the treatment of net less than two centimeters, the option one is to, uh, is to, follow, to follow them, not to treat. It's a problem for this patient because uh, they have to, to be followed a long time and we don't know uh, the, uh, the, the evolution and the risk of local uh, evolution of their uh, lesion. So we treat them if the lesion uh, is less than two centimeters. And now for the PCN, uh, it's the same risk. Uh, the, the patient can uh, have an evolution of their uh, lesion in, uh, with the risk of growth and the risk of uh, nodule noir uh, and risk of pancreatic cancer uh, and the uh, follow, of, the follow of this lesion is uh, unknown. Uh, many many uh, of them uh, have to be uh, followed a long time uh, uh, because there is the risk of uh, pancreatic cancer. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have another, just a technical question. Uh, you suck the cystic fluid before applying RFA in the pancreatic cystic lesion, but you use the same RFA needle or you use before a normal FNA needle and then you puncture with the RFA needle? Uh, the first step is to uh, suck uh, partially uh, the uh, lesion with uh, a, a 19 uh, gauge needle, uh, not, not with the uh, LFA needle, with another uh, fine needle. And we have to suck partially, uh, be careful not to suck the totality of the lesion uh, because the, the risk is. Uh, uh, I don't know how the risk is to, to burn completely. The, the risk is to burn. The, the risk to burn the adjacent pancreas. Okay. And we have to suck partially uh, only. Not completely. You not suck completely the cystic yes. lesion in order to have some uh, room uh, to apply the yes. RFA and not to go into the pancreatic parenchyma uh, around. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So just audio, can I say just just one thing? Uh, Taiwan company is actually working about a new needle. So with the same needle, you could aspirate the fluid content, and after you can treat with airfa. So you avoid to have insertion at uh, two times of the two times. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, your your initial study, I think, uh, did uh, have some complications and led to some change in your protocol. Can you comment on that, on the uh, risk of um, infection of uh, pancreatitis and the risks uh, related to uh, close proximity to the pancreatic duct? Because th those were all issues initially, I believe. The, the first complication in the first uh, study was uh, uh, pancreatic infection. So then all the patients uh, were, uh, all the patients uh, were enrolled with uh, antibiotic prophylaxis and no one developed in, uh, infection. Uh, the second uh, uh, risk of complication is acute pancreatitis. So uh, when we uh, uh, we do uh, we, we treat them uh, before uh, airflow application with uh, NS aid, there is no acute pancreatitis. The first patient who developed a, a duct uh, a stenosis was treated uh, with uh, endoscopy, endoscopic management with uh, a pancreati pancreatic uh, prothesis, plastic pan pancreatitis. So all the uh, other patients, no one developed acute pancreatitis. There's one question here, whether you do have any cases where the patient, for whatever reason, was resected after RFA so that you could assess uh, histologically the, uh, the uh, real effect of your RFA. Did you have any such cases? The question was, okay, ju just, uh, just uh, translate. Okay, we have no case, no case uh, for NET and for PCN for subse subsequent surgery. 
So we, we have no pathological control after RFA, after RFA treatment. Okay, but as you see, we did for each patient at the end of the follow-up, so, so more than three years, we did a CT scan and EUS for, for NET and MRI and EUS for uh, ICMN. And we have, uh, we, you, you, you saw the results with 85% of complete disappearance of NET tumor and 66 complete response for IPMN. And all the MUAN models uh, disappeared completely at the end of the follow-up. So at the moment, if you have a patient who says, I want my uh, cancer removed, uh, do you try to uh, convince them to do this instead? Or is it still, how do you sort of decide on patient selection at this point? Uh, just last, I, I just uh, help uh, more. <laughs> uh, just, uh, it was very interesting because it was two cases of pancreatic adenocarcinoma located in the tail of the pancreas, where, whereas the first lesion was treated in the head of the pancreas. And there was no, not at all, uh, cystic lesion uh, in the tail of the pancreas. So this is not a complication of IPMN. This mm -hmm. is a co-location, which is known, actually, mm -hmm. of distant pancreatic adenocarcinoma from the initial IPMN. We know that the risk is in the literature is ranging between five to to sixteen percent of the of the different series, so sometimes it, it could be very important. So, no, our uh, advice is to check all the pancreatic okay. gland because uh, you have a risk of uh, a distant and concomitant pancreatic adenocarcinoma distant from the IPMN, and you you saw in our series is not so infrequent because there was two patients uh, among seventeen patients. Okay, I think we are near the last time of our webinar and uh, I have still another small question, uh, technical question for you. When you have a lesion in the pancreatic isthmus or in the pancreatic body, it is very difficult uh, that you can have uh, a distance between the lesion and the virsum duct superior to two millimeters. In this case, do you think that uh, uh, stenting of the virsum can be uh, prophylactic for uh, uh, the prevention of uh, pancreatitis or uh, pancreatic duct stenosis post RFA? Okay. Uh, when the uh, virsum uh, is uh, near the lesion uh, and the, uh, the distance is lower than uh, two millimeter. Uh, with Mark, uh, first step is uh, to introduce uh, uh, prothes prosthesis in pancreatic duct. Yes. So we avoid the uh, risk of uh, uh, duct stenosis and pancreatitis. It, the, the, this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this work is uh, we, we do this in PCN. In PCN, first treatment consists to uh, treat the vessel duct. So ju just to, 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 to try to be more precise to, to answer to your question, if you look to the overall complication uh, of RFA treatments, the rate is 3%. And if you look to the co complication rate of USCP, we had an excellent lecture before, uh, the risk is uh, about 3%. So. Mm -hmm. It's comparable to the mm. risk of spontaneous complication on the, on the pancreatic duct after RFA or after USCP. So uh, you have to choose. So it's, 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 it's an indication for discussion between experts and you have, you, you have to choose and also to discuss with the patient. Mm. But we, we, in, in, if we have a, a distance less than two millimeter, always we discuss first with the patient and with our, our other experts, mm. for, do, we, you, do we need a uh, uh, pancreatic stenting before or not? Because the risk is comparable, 3%. Very good, very good point. Thank you. <laughs> so, I think we can go towards the end of this uh, webinar. Can we have uh, the last uh, slide? Uh, I can tell you that uh, the recording of this uh, webinar will be posted on the e-learning section of the ESGE website. 
there you can already find the past webinars. You can uh, have a look uh, at the, all the webinars at the www.esg.com. And uh, for sure, we have to thank the ESGE Governing Board. And also, I think for uh, the, this webinar related to the ESG Days, uh, also the ESG Days Scientific Committee, but mainly today to the webinar team, a lot of thanks to Claire Guy, David Inker, Nina Menard, and Veronica Bonalumi. Thank you very much for your very good cooperation uh, for uh, the, I, I think, the good uh, uh, outcome of this uh, webinar. Uh, the, the next semi webinar will be uh, on June 10 and next uh, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, yes. Uh, it will be again uh, about the best abstracts from ESG days 2020 in Dublin, about uh, the topics of upper GI and uh, lower GI. And uh, I think that uh, with uh, this slide, we can uh, stop with this seminar. Lars, if you want to tell some words anymore. Thank you so much, Claudio, for excellent co-moderation. And um, all have a good evening. Good evening to all of you. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And congratulations for the organization.